Good morning and welcome to Vols on the Ground. And I should have a Vols background, but it wouldn't work this morning. We may get it before the end of the session, but we'll start off with you in my home office. So I want to welcome you all here on behalf of the Board of Volunteers of Legal Service and all of our staff. Um, and Karen Arts Ash, who is chair of the board. My name is Ian Benjamin, and I am proud to have begun as the interim executive director just a couple of weeks ago. And I'm getting to learn VOLS, and I expect to be learning a bit more myself this morning together with you. We're going to hear presentations by a number of our partners and reflections on our outgoing executive director, Marsha Levy, who has led us so ably over recent years. We're now seven months into the pandemic. We recently conducted an analysis to take stock of our impact this past year. Vols programs have grown in response to the increased community need to meet the needs of our ultimate clients. Each of those clients and our served communities are particularly impacted by the three crises facing our city, the pandemic, racial injustice, and the economic recession. We operate through seven separate projects, projects perhaps most significantly uh, have grown with the pandemic, the micro enterprise project serving some 1200 small business owners, their employees and family members, the unemployed workers project serving over 700 workers and their household members, and the COVID-19 frontline and healthcare workers initiative serving 110 workers and their loved ones. Our elderly project and veterans initiative has continued to serve almost 1,900 seniors and older veterans and their loved ones, uh, even with the difficulty in reaching them with senior centers closed. Our immigration project, dealing with the very challenging times for immigrant youth and their family members is serving over a thousand uh, such members of the community. Our incarcerated mothers law project continues to provide support to 170 mothers and their children, and our children's project continues to serve some 280 children and their family members. So in this last year, we directly benefited through our services, uh, which are only made possible through the support of other organizations, uh, some 5,384 low-income New Yorkers, uh, and we're serving across all of the boroughs. John, can you move on? We collaborate with more than 200 community-based groups across all the five boroughs in New York City. I haven't checked where all these dots are, uh, but uh, they are representing many of those community organizations. They're trusted local organizations to ensure that our neighbors can access VOL services when and where they're most needed. And turn to the next one. Uh, our, our attorneys and other team members train attorneys in the areas of law that are so important to meeting the needs of the various projects. And here we've noted some of those uh, firms that are so important to our ability to meet the needs of clients. And we maintain a network of over 1,600 volunteer attorneys and last year our volunteers provided over 18,000 hours of pro bono service. Now these programs and what we're doing together represent an expansion of how we serve New Yorkers. Uh, we co-launched this year the Small Business Legal Relief Alliance to support small business owners, relaunching our unemployment workers project, unemployed workers project, assisting New Yorkers in accessing their deserved benefits, and we newly launched our Frontline and Healthcare Workers Initiative. You'll hear today from representatives of each of these initiatives, as well as from our partners, 
of the uh, VOLS immigration project. As incoming executive director, I already know that I should bring you one strong message. And that message is thank you. Thank you for all of you do to support us and to support the clients that we are serving. And at this time, we have worked hard to bring New Yorkers together, uh, as we have done at VOLS since our founding in 1984. Then to confront severe federal budget deficits that year to legal services. And sadly, we're seeing cuts again to legal services now. But now I want to hand over to, to Pete and he's going to introduce himself. Pete is our legal director, as well as leading uh, a number of our projects directly. So Pete, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, so as Ian mentioned, we have all of these projects and initiatives that are aimed at serving low-income New Yorkers and really the most vulnerable during um, these multiple crises. And, and as a result of VOL's legal initiatives and projects, our aim is to ensure that our clients can attain dignity, security, and opportunity by overcoming the challenges uh, that they face with the support of VOL staff or the pro bono attorneys that we work with. All of our speakers this morning partner with VOLVES towards that goal, uh, both for individual clients and also with a view towards justice for the community at large. And, and, and VOLVES is all about these partnerships and you will hear from different aspects of those partnerships, community-based organizations, other legal services providers, pro bono attorneys. Uh, and, and pro bono is really what fuels our organization. Coming up on the week of October 25th, is pro bono week. Um, and, and that is a time that we recognize the need for pro bono to supplement what is being done in the, in the, in the regular legal services community um, and also to applaud all of the volunteers that work with us day in and day out to serve our clients. Our first speaker, um, our first guest uh, is uh, Denise Vivar, who is the interim specialist in at the Immigration Student Success Center at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Uh, Denise serves as VOL's main partner at the Student Success Center, uh, where we provide immigration legal services for immigrant students and their families, as well as support for the school staff. Uh, this past summer, we worked together with them to ensure that DACA recipients were able to renew their status ahead of the Supreme Court decision, which at least temporarily kept intact the program uh, against the proposed termination by the Trump administration. Uh, the future of DACA and many other immigration programs will really be determined uh, by what is gonna be the most decisive elections of our lifetimes. Uh, and our partnership with the Immigrant Student Su Success Center will be even more critical moving forward. So Denise, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here this morning. So I am, my name is Denise. I'm the interim specialist at the Immigrant Student Success Center. Uh, this center was the first one created in a CUNY and it is a welcoming and safe space that helps students develop emotional well-being, a sense of community and belonging and empowerment. The center values and understands the experiences and documents the students bring to higher education and works to help them develop their unique gifts. With this mission statement in mind, we seek to provide a range of services to empower students to succeed inside and outside the classroom. We provide mental health support, deportation defense, postgraduate support, collaborative programming, uh, financial guidance and an emergency fund, and legal services. This is where VOLS comes in. Uh, VOLS, this partnership started over the summer where VOLS really helped us provide legal services to our students and their families. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, it was very challenging for our students. They were navigating multiple issues. A lot of the parents lost their income. They lost their income. Um, as we know, a lot of the immigration, a lot of the COVID relief uh, was not available to them and their family. So they were really struggling with that. Um, and then on top of that, a lot of the students that we work with were affected by the Supreme Court ruling. Um, so there was a lot of things happening all at once for them. And VOLS was there to sort of help us provide that legal guidance to our students 
uh, we hosted a DACA info session where 42 faculty joined because we believe that in order for students to be supported in higher education, the faculty must be informed about immigration policies that affect their students' academic success in the classroom. Um, we have also, uh, with Walls, we have also worked with, um, to provide legal screenings, not only to students, but their families. Many times high school, high school students going into college students and college students don't know that they are immigration relief forms that they do qualify for until a legal screening is done. And many times, a lot of the students also already qualify for something that their parents are applying, but the lack of communication between families prevent the students from sometimes finding out. And it is through these legal screenings that our students are able to see um, if they do qualify for an Im immigration relief form and how we move forward. Um, and I know even from some of the screenings that have been hosted, a lot of the students that qualify for SIDGE, right, we're able to catch them early before they age out and we're able to support them through that process. Um, we are also working on a different variety of forms of immigration relief. A lot of the students that we work with are afraid, right, of a virtual legal screening or they're even like, why am I even going to apply um, for a legal screening if I don't know? So we're working on a series of different workshops where anybody could join and just learn different information. Um, and then from there, they could decide from themselves if they do want a legal screening, if they do think that there is uh, an immigration relief form. So we also want to give students that agency. Um, and in terms of challenges for the future and seeing, I'm not sure if the challenges will change or they, they even before the COVID pandemic, we were already offering legal screenings um, because it is something that is needed. Um, but I do know that immigration legal services will always be needed by our students. Um, and I think our collaboration with Balls will continue to help us evaluate where to best serve students and where to best serve their needs as we keep going. Um, and as you know, as we hear for any immigration law changes or any new developments, it will be sort of on a kind of base-to-base evaluation on how we could better serve them and continue supporting them. Thanks so much, Deesa. And, and, and just one quick question. In the next three to six months, what is your top priority or hope? And, and I know that there's something on the calendar about 20 days from now. Yeah, I think my main priority is at the moment students' mental health. Um, and I think that it it's important because they're also, you know, these are students that are expected to, to go to school and graduate and many times there's no, you know, pathway to citizenship so they don't have a work permit. Um, so whatever comes out in the next month, um, I believe it's going to be in a way detrimental, whichever way it goes, um, because that's really like affected them. And then from there figuring out, I, like again, a lot of this is uh, legal services because a lot of these things are constantly changing. Um, so this is where Vols in a way has, like this is where I see our collaboration with Vols going to kind of seeing where are the gaps and how we could keep informing the community I serve. Right, thank you so much, Denise, and thanks for the great work that you do. Next, I'd like to introduce Ro Malik, who is Senior VP and Assistant General Counsel at City. Uh, he has been an active volunteer with Vol the Vols Unemployed Workers Project uh, and is actively recruiting other members of his department to volunteer. He actually first volunteered with us uh, as a Skadden associate and carried that spirit of volunteering with him when he joined Citigroup as Assistant General Counsel. Uh, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, we relaunched a 10-year-old project and hotline that had served New Yorkers during the Great recession in order to field questions from people who are attempting to claim state unemployment insurance or pandemic unemployment insurance. Vol staff recruited and trained pro bono attorneys to assist with the unprecedented volume of unemployed workers seeking guidance and answers to unemployment insurance issues. We utilized our broad network of pro bono volunteers at law firms and companies and we responded as Ian pointed out to over 700 callers and trained over a hundred pro bono attorneys. So Ro, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Pete. Uh, it's nice to be here um, uh, remotely. 
Um, I first learned about the Vols Unemployment Workers Project as a mergers and acquisitions attorney several years ago at Skadden Arts from Brennan Devaney, uh, Skadden's head of pro bono. Uh, every few weeks in the middle of some active M&A negotiation, I re receive an email, usually with a list of very interesting cases of people who had not received their unemployment benefits that they should have been entitled to. As an M&A attorney, I tend to focus on drafting, analyzing, and negotiating contracts to buy and sell businesses. So at first, when I saw the list of cases, I hesitated to take one on, unsure of my litigation skills. But the Vol staff reassured me that I could handle it and work with me hand in glove to represent claimants. Plus, I never wanted to lose the advocacy skills I acquired in law school, as well as the personal commitment to workers' rights that led me to the law in the first place. Since embarking on a legal career more than a decade ago, I've worked on several pro bono matters, but none compared to the level of one-on-one -on -one client engagement and partnership that the Vols Unemployment Workers Project provided me. One of my most interesting Vols pro bono engagements was representing an unemployment relief claimant who had initially represented himself pro bono, pro se. The, the, transcript that I, <clears throat> uh, the transcript that I read from his initial hearing indicated that he continued to interrupt the judge and the other party without directly answering questions. He also failed to address the accusations leveled at him. The judge ruled against him, revoking any future benefits and applying a fine to him for wanton deception. I appealed his case to the Department of Labor to remove the fines and restore his benefits in partnership with Vols. I clarified that his forms and initial testimony reflected inadvertent error and not wanting deception or disregard for the law. With Vols, I coached the claimant on how to answer the questions from the administrative law judge and helped calm many of his fears and also brought in a witness to, on his behalf. Since the witness's English language skills were limited, I had to prepare him using my elementary Spanish at the time, which after this case rose perhaps to an intermediate level. We were able to win on the key count at issue, and I appealed the secondary account to a higher New York appeals court in a written petition. Since that case, I moved from law firm practice at Skadden to an in-house M&A role at Citigroup. At City, I have led several pro bono initiatives. The one which I am most invested now is building a new pro bono partnership between City and Vols, one that I am undertaking with Olga Medjuk and Tori Roseman, the fearless leaders of the unemployment, Vols Unemployment Workers Project. As Olga and Tori can attest, the Vols Unemployment Workers Project hotline has been ringing off the hook to help recently unemployed workers in desperate need of understanding what benefits they are entitled to. The CARES Act and Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Fund are often unwieldy and confusing. For workers who recently lost their jobs due to the pandemic, to know that having Vols and partners to organizations like City in their corner can relieve some of that anguish. I'm proud to help lead City's efforts in partnering with such an important organization in Vols at such a critical and trying time for workers in our nation. That's great. Thank you so much, Ro. Um, and, and, and really great to hear about that emerging partnership and, and building that up at your organization. Uh, so our next guest, is Karen Osowski um, of the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, who organized the United for Small Business NYC Coalition of Small Business Owners and Advocates, including VALS. Our work with small businesses includes a broad range of partners, including the new pro bono coalition, Small Business Relief Alliance that VALS helped launch with over 25 law firms, companies, and legal services providers. Uh, to introduce Karen and our community-focused work, we're going to show a quick video uh, back from the summer when, when, with remarks from Vols Micro Enterprise Director uh, Arthur Katz. At the time of the video, the United for Small Business NYC Coalition was actively coordinating with Vols, Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A, and Take Root Justice to promote the urgent needs of small businesses during the economic crisis and to promote the continued city funding specifically for the purpose of commercial lease assistance, which was eventually provided after an initial cut. So here's the video. Council that work? Governor, thank you, yep. small business owners. Thank you, everybody who's here today listening to us talk about the work that we're doing that we hope to do in the future. Um, I just wanted to take you back because I was back on the ground floor when this program was getting started, when the reorganization company together. We met the call um, with the help of USDNYC to make an economic justice program. We made the call, we met the call to make a racial justice program. 
99% of our clients are low income. 75% of our clients are people of color. We serve people who don't speak English. We serve people in outer boroughs. Um, we serve immigrants, minorities, women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, queer-owned businesses. Those are our focal points. Those are, those are the business owners who haven't had the tools, who haven't had the access to resources that we focus on. And, and we get results. I still have, I come from private practice um, before I jumped ship and, and became a nonprofit attorney. And I still have a network of private attorneys who are having a really hard time uh, uh, representing commercial tenants uh, against their landlords. Um, and, I, and I hear that throughout the chatter. I hear that in the, in the bar. Um, we, on the other hand, get results. It's hard. My team works really hard. The group team works really hard. I have but as you heard, we are getting results for our clients. We are getting terminations. We are getting abatements, agreements. We are getting certainty for these clients at a moment when they need it most. Right? And just keep in mind, the courts are about to reopen. Landlords are getting their papers together for all of the months of rent that, that clients couldn't, couldn't be paid because they've been forced to close because of the pause order. Um, and so just because they're about allowed to reopen doesn't mean that their problems are about to cease. So I just I want to say thank you to the small business owners today who shared your stories. Thank you to the CLA attorneys who are continuing to fight every single day. Um, and thank you to Councilmember Rivera and the rest of the council who can hopefully keep this program to continue. And, and with that introduction, I now I welcome Karen to share the current focus of United for Small Business NYC. Karen? Great, thanks so much, Peter. Um, and I'm really happy to be here and working in coalition with so many amazing groups, directly and indirectly. Um, so as Peter mentioned, my name is Karen Rasky, um, and I'm a senior organizer for equitable economic development um, at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, um, we call ANHD for short. Um, and we're a, kind of a membership organization of over 80 neighborhood-based uh, CBOs working for affordable housing and thriving neighborhoods. Um, and for the last five years, we've really been focused on, um, as one of our strategies for equitable economic growth, um, supporting commercial tenants and fighting against small business displacement by convening the United for Small Business Coalition, um, also known as USBNYC. And Vols has been a really active member of that coalition for several years now. Um, and we've been lucky to accomplish some, um, some really powerful victories, even in the midst of these very challenging times. Uh, so USB NYC is a coalition of community groups who support, organize, and represent small businesses, uh, mainly in low-income communities uh, and communities of color. Um, and in the last five years, we have won city legislation against tenant harassment. Uh, we've helped create a program to track data on commercial properties, and we've also seen, um, as you heard from this video, um, the creation of the Commercial Lease Assistance Program. Um, so CLA was launched in the spring of 2018 by SBS um, as a result of USBNYC's organizing. Um, and as Arthur mentioned in the video that we just saw, it's been an incredibly important resource uh, for small business tenants, especially during COVID. Um, so our coalition includes legal service providers like Bowles, um, who help small business owners um, go with lease negotiations um, and disputes with their landlords. Um, and it also includes community partners uh, who refer their members um, to Bulls and other uh, providers for legal support. So it's really, we've been able to create um, both the advocacy to help um, bring these programs into being and then also the, the um, kind of organizational infrastructure to help our small businesses um, survive. Um, and it's really surprising for a lot of people to learn how few protections and regulations exist for small businesses in New York City, um, especially given that they're, such, they're playing such a central role in the city's economy and the city's identity. But small businesses who rent their space really are at the mercy of their landlord, um, and many of them have a hard time negotiating a fair lease in this climate, um, and many uh, don't have a lease at all. So business owners from marginalized communities, as you can imagine, uh, are at an extra disadvantage, especially if English is not their first language, um, if they're in a neighborhood that's gentrifying and rents are rising. Um, so the CLA program is a really important way to level the playing field between property owners and commercial tenants um, and give business owners the tools that they need to fight displacement. Um, so unsurprisingly, uh, it's been a really devastating year for um, a lot of the small businesses that uh, 
schools and our other coalition members work with. Um, so given the situation this year and the number of businesses needing assistance, uh, we were really shocked to learn that CLA was being eliminated from the city budget this spring. Um, and the video that you saw was part of our effort um, to get council members and the mayor to restore funding for this important program in the budget. Um, and while it didn't happen in the budget, we actually were able to make an impact um, because a few months later, the city announced the restoration of the CLA program. And uh, we actually hope to see it reinstated um, very soon before the end of the year. So we're really, really excited about that um, and looking forward. Um, I know that Bulls has been continuing to provide support uh, to small business tenants um, as much as they can, but we're really looking forward to having that, um, that infrastructure available to prevent small business displacement. Um, you know, one of the most urgent issues for our coalition has always been the high cost of commercial rent. Um, in 2019, even before COVID, um, ANHD partnered with three other USBNYC member organizations and we found that rent was the top concern for 82 of the business, 82 percent, excuse me, of the businesses that we spoke to. Um, so obviously, the loss of income and the uncertainty of the pandemic has made the situation much worse. Um, small businesses are on the hook for the inflated commercial rents that they pay, even during the time when they had to close for public health reasons. Um, but that we really haven't seen um, comprehensive solutions at any level of government, um, and each business owner is kind of left on their own to negotiate with their landlord. Um, and the longer that's the case, the more businesses are just going to decide to close because they can't make it work. Um, and so um, we have been advocating at the city and state level for comprehensive rent relief for small businesses um, that would be retroactive and going forward until the state of emergency is over. Um, and I think if there is no rent relief, unfortunately, we're going to see closures of the small businesses that provide affordable and culturally relevant services. We're going to see loss of employment for the people who work at those businesses and continued kind of consolidation of commercial space in fewer and fewer hands. Um, so it's definitely a, it's a challenging situation, but I think um, we are really lucky and in a unique situation compared to other cities to have a coalition like USBNYC that is really pushing back against this dynamic. Um, and we're so happy to have Bulls as a part of that coalition and a partner in that work. Thank you so much, Karen. And I really, with the restoration of the CLA program, shows the power of organizers like you working hand in hand with legal services. Um, so we really thank you for your partnership. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce, introduce Bill Whalen, um, who is the director of DC 37's Municipal Employees Legal Services Program, uh, DC 37 MELS. Uh, partners with us on the Frontline and Healthcare Workers Initiative. DC 37 is New York City's largest public employee union, and its members are really the lifeblood of New York City. Uh, they work in our schools, they work in our hospitals, in our parks, and really in almost every facet of New York City life. Uh, partnering with DC 37 MELS on this initiative has allowed us to serve dozens of families who are putting themselves at risk in frontline jobs during this pandemic. So, Bill, on to you. Hi, good morning, everybody. And I wanna thank all of the pro bono attorneys who really have uh, stood up for our members. It's meant a lot to the DC 37 uh, workers. So a little bit about DC 37, we're 150,000 workers, 63 different locals. Now, 9,000 of these workers work in municipal hospitals. Another 24,000 of them work in public schools. 4,500 of them are EMT, emergency medical technicians, who respond to people's homes and brought them to the emergency rooms as they were suffering from COVID. Thousands more work for the city's health department, nurses, epi epidemiologists, road, tunnel, bridge workers, lifeguards, parkies, daycare, Head Start, adult protective services, agency for children's services, homeless services. These are people who were essential workers who were out on the street serving New York during this whole pandemic. They had no option to work at home. They were out there, just, just out there. One of the things, you know, we talk about frontline. One of the things that's important to realize about DC 37 members is that they're in the front line of life always. They have no cushion. This pandemic was just another hardship in their life. The average salary for my members is $37,000 a year. 
they have no options. They live in communities of color, which were just devastated by the pandemic. And th that's really it was very, very difficult. In the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, we had to do, we have a death benefit, which pays out death benefits for retirees and, and members who pass away. So we had to, I had to do virtual notaries of the death benefit applications. Every day I spoke to maybe a dozen survivors of city workers and retirees. And the stories, these are people who lost their loved ones, unable to be with them. They died all alone in hospitals. A, a father who lost his 35 year old son, his only child. A girl who lost, a woman who lost her mother. She was 21 years old. She's left with siblings, had to bury her mother. She knows nothing about any of this. The stories were just horrific. So Mel's, what Mel's is, is the legal services office for, for union members. We have 120 lawyers. Our, we have a unit that does wills and we have four, four lawyers and a supervisor. And that's all the people that we really have dedicated to wills. And many of our members were looking to get their affairs in order. They were terrified. We had school workers who were doing the grab and go lunches and uh, school, uh, lunch workers who had to show up. People in hospitals, they wanted powers of attorney. They wanted wills. We were inundated with requests for assistance and we really couldn't do it on our own. And thankfully, Vols partnered with us and were able to provide these life planning documents to our members. Um, so we're very, very grateful for what, for what the pro bono attorneys have done to help us. Our members face many, many challenges. I think in the next six months, I think that's a question that, that, that Peter was asking. In the next six months, what we face is an onslaught of evictions as the courts open up. Our members, they make $37,000 a year and they live in the city of New York. Their average paychecks, it takes a paycheck and a half. They get two paychecks a month. It's a paycheck and a half just to pay your rent. Tremendous hardship. The mental health of our members, the stress that they're under. Was the schools reopened, our schools division was inundated with, with members who were terrified about having to having to show up into unventilated buildings. So our job in the next six months is to, is to stand by our members as evictions ramp up, as foreclosures start, as their mental health deteriorates. Our screening unit gets 3,000 calls a month from city workers who are looking for MELS to help them. So again, I wanted to thank you guys for stepping up and helping us as we help the city of New York and its residents. And uh, that's it. Thanks so much, Bill. And it has really been a pleasure to partner with you on this project and to help your members who, who like I said, are the lifeblood of our city. So, so thank you for the work that you do every day. Um, so I now want to pass the mic uh, over to Sarah Efron, who is the VOL's Director of Pro Bono and Strategic Initiatives. On to you, Sarah. Good morning. I'm now pleased to introduce the final part of this program and to celebrate and offer a fond farewell to outgoing Executive Director Marsha Levy, who is taking on a new role as Associate Professor and Director of Legal Residencies at the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. Before we hear from Marsha, I'm introducing two reflections. First, from VOL's board chair, Karen Arts Ash, a partner and national co chairperson, Intellectual Property Department at Catton. Although Karen was unable to join today due to a scheduling conflict, she asked for these remarks to be shared with you on her behalf. I want to take this opportunity to express the affection and appreciation of the VOL staff, leadership, and our board of directors for Marsha Levy's tireless work and dedication. During her tenure at Balls, Marsha updated our human infrastructure, oversaw an expansion of our programs, and helped to raise both money and community awareness. Please join me in thanking Marsha for her service to Balls and its clients, as we wish her all the best in her return to academia. Next, I would like to introduce Brenda Devaney, Director of Pro Bono Programs and Pro Bono Council at Skadden Arps. 
Brenna is a longtime champion of Vols and has inspired Skadden lawyers to work on many of our projects, including a highly successful partnership with the Dream School through our school-based children's project. Vols was formed by the city's major law firms and corporate law departments in 1984 in response to severe federal budget cuts to legal services for low-income Americans. Our pro bono relationships with over 70 law firms and companies are at the core of our history and unique capacity at Vols. Skadden is one of our most active law firms, including participation in longtime board service and significant pro bono contributions across the three plus decades. From that vantage point, we are fortunate to now hear from Brenna as she reflects upon Vols' impact under Marsha's tenure. Brenna, I'll turn it over to you now. Good morning, and thank you so much, Sarah, for that really kind introduction. Certainly, Skadden is very, very proud of its long history with Walls. So it's such a privilege to be, have been invited to talk with you all this morning about why I appreciate Vols now, before, and certainly will in the future. And of course, most importantly this morning, to lift up our community's admiration and thanks for, um, for and to Marsha uh, as we send her off in her, to her next adventure. Balls is the best of pro bono. Uh, from day one, its model has been to inform, direct, evaluate, leverage, encourage, and champion the resources of the private bar in service of under-resourced people and communities. Balls is the ultimate efficiency builder, efficiency finder, and Vols is the expert connector and matchmaker um, of people with needs and, and to the resources that will help them, of lawyers who care about things in this world, um, to the places and people and communities who need their assistance. Vols cultivates the absolute best in us. I think that you saw that showcase today in hearing from so many important community partners to Vols. I, I think you saw that in Roe's involvement uh, with Vols before his time at City and certainly now. I hope you see that in my involvement with, with Vols as well. And absolutely, we see what Vols brings out in terms of the best of people in Marsha's leadership in Vols. So let's, let's talk about Marsha for a few minutes. Um, in every role that I've known Marsha to take on, she is the piece of the puzzle that was needed to keep things moving forward. She's not the last piece, but she's, more so, she's something more like the corner piece or the foundational piece that you needed to find or you might have thought about giving up. And I think that she's done that foundational corner turning type work for Vols during her tenure as its leader. You, you see the impact of Marsha's savvy and sophisticated leadership in partnership with her dedicated and committed staff and the impact that has on the New York City community and beyond in this COVID moment where Marsha and the rest of the organization were able to pivot what they already did so well to increase the services through, a, through remote platforms, um, to create new specific initiatives and responses that helps people who are on the front line and really in need. We heard about quite a lot of that work today and it's, it's it's been so, such an honor to be a part of that and to witness and observe the ability that Vols under Marsh's leadership has had to be, play a, a, an important role during the pandemic. Marsha, much like she has in many moments before, was called upon by leaders and other stakeholders during the pandemic to do what she, like no other, can do. And that's to create dialogue across communities and stakeholders, to come up with solutions, to smooth the edges, um, and to make sure that we're working together in community to achieve the things that need to be done. I think she's able to do this not only because she has experience in almost every sector that law lawyers find ourselves in, and so she knows how to create those cross-sector dialogues, but also because she has remarkable expertise, compassion, kindness, dedication, and is one of the hardest working people I know. So that impact has been felt by all of us I know throughout this pandemic and before um, by Vols and the community that surrounds Vols. Marsha is someone who, through all of her um, expertise, kindness, compassion, and, and so on, creates pro bono magic. Vols is going to be okay, as it says farewell, fondly and with thanks to Marsha, 
because Vols is mighty and smart and strong and filled up with the most dedicated people I know. And Marsha is going to be okay as she goes on to do her magic at the New Hampshire School of Law. But I don't think anyone would argue with me when I say and believe that Vols and Marsha are better for their time together. I'm so glad that I had a front row seat for this, this time period in Vols history to witness Marsha's effective leadership and all that they accomplished together. So I would invite you now this morning to raise a coffee mug and uh, send Marsha off with uh, all of our thanks, lots of love, a hope that our paths cross over and over and over again, um, because we know she's on to great things and we know Vols will continue to do great things. I'd also like to send my own welcome and the law firm community welcome to Ian in his role as interim executive director as the organization recruits a permanent leader. I'm looking forward to working with Ian as well. And now I'd like to turn it over to Marsha, my very good friend and someone who I respect very, very much to, quote, to give us her own remarks. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you, Brenna, and thank you to everybody who's here, um, I would say I'm speechless and I kind of am. I, you know, I think everybody knows I love to celebrate for others, but I'm not so much liking to be um, the person being celebrated. So um, I appreciate pro bono magic. I mean, I don't know that anyone could say anything better about me, um, but I would like to focus really on Vols and the wonderful time it has been um, to work together. Um, as people know, I'm now living in New Hampshire. You can tell I actually have a staircase. I'm in a house, it's unbelievable. Um, but I was thinking of an analogy and I figured I had to come up with something that's gonna be about my new life. So I thought a skiing analogy as relates to my work with Vols. So people have heard me talk about the airplane, but now I'm gonna talk about the ski slope. And I'm going to be on the Black Diamond, you know, trail. And the skier is Vols. Because Vols brings to that slope a tremendous amount of expertise and skill. The ability to face any circumstance affecting low-income New Yorkers and think creatively about how to approach it. And COVID-19 was the ultimate example. You know, when I think back to leaving the office on March 13th, just two days after we were supposed to have our first ever gala celebrating 35 years and our summit on the intersection between pro bono and DEI initiatives, you know, I thought, what's going to happen? And you know what? I didn't really actually have to think longer than the weekend because the Vols staff, every single person stepped up to work with their communities and figure out what was needed. And it was funny because as we were doing work with some of the COVID-19 coalition and the New York State Bar Association and with the New York City Bar, and we were all working together, people were talking about surges in work. And I kept saying, surge, we've surged on day one and our clients need us now more than ever. And you can see that in just what you've heard from the community. But here's why I'm also using the skiing analogy, because we don't slalom. We ski on two skis, and the skis are really our community partners, who you heard from this morning, and our pro bono partners, you know, who you have heard from, who are there listening, who Brenna represented. And from day one of the pandemic, and I'm just going to talk about that for a minute, our partnerships were critical to being able to do the work the ability to reach out to an organization like Mills and be able to say, you know, what, what can we do? And to work together and to immediately work together and then have Jackie Haberfield from Kirkland and Ellis be able to put together a program so that we could easily, easily do that work. And, and the list goes on. I work with SCAD and I work with Paul Weiss on unemployment, our SBLRA work with so many firms companies and legal service organizations on behalf of small businesses. That's the skiing down the slope, our expert staff steering, figuring out what direction to go in, but being able to do that by being held steady by the community and of organizations, by our clients and by our pro bono partners. 
And that's just a wonderful model. And it's a model that I was so excited to get to work with and get to expand and get to learn from. And we learn from each other and that's what's so important. So, you know, one leader is a leader for the moments. My moments tend to be a little shorter than most, I must admit, but it doesn't make a difference because a strong organization is empowered in some ways by a strong leader, but they also help a leader be able to be strong. And the Vol staff, every single one of them, whatever their role is, bring such tremendous passion, experience, and commitment that, you know, it doesn't matter that today is my last day and I'm going off hiking. No, I'm just kidding. I'm actually going to work. But it just doesn't matter because everything will be great. And what's so exciting is that, you know, I love transformation. That's something that, you know, I thrive on personally. But I also think organizations thrive on transformation. And I think that we have a real steady organization right now. And whoever the new leader is, they're going to come in with the ability to build on the two bills that came before me and then the work that I did and then whatever they will do to continue to utilize Vol's experience and Vol's expertise and Vol's connections to be able to work on behalf of the New Yorkers that now more than ever need our help. So thank you to all of you. It's been such a pleasure. If you're in New Hampshire, come visit. If you're skiing, don't call me. I actually don't ski. I hope that analogy actually was accurate, um, but I'll look forward to seeing you. And certainly I'll be keeping up and lurking in the background, you know, of New York kind of work to see how you were all doing. So thank you and take care. Marsha, thank you. Thank you so much for those words. Thank you for everything that you have done. Um, I, I'm not staying for long, so the size of your shoes to follow uh, is much more significant for the person who comes after me, uh, but I know those shoes are big uh, and I want to thank you. And I come into this as a, as a non-lawyer, but who has, who has been uh, an observer of legal services and legal service providers in New York City, both in the work that I have done uh, and at home. Uh, for many years, and, and I'm very pleased to be participating at a greater level. So thank you very much, Marsha. Marsha talks about skiing. That analogy reminds us of the privilege which all of us have, and that we need to remember as we reach out to support those who do not grow up with the privilege that uh, many of us have uh, grown up with and live with today. And meeting those needs is so important and what we do at Vols every day. It's what we've heard each of our representative organizations talking about today. And, and I want to thank in particular, Denise, Rowe, Karen, and Bill, uh, and thank Brenner on behalf of the law firm community, um, for everything that you do. Uh, the approximately 20 members of our staff work, as everybody has said, in a very dedicated way every day to support um, those in need in New York City. And thank you for all your help uh, that you do. Thank you in particular to, to Pete for uh, emceeing, uh, Sarah for Arthur, who spoke months ago, but we heard him anyway. Um, and John, Laura, and Caution, who have managed the technical aspects of today, and Caution in particular, because somehow or other he has made sure that everybody's face is in front of you at the right time uh, this morning. Um, in three weeks from yesterday, we have the opportunity to vote. Um, as VOLs, we are encouraging all of our employees to vote. Uh, and I encourage all of you to vote. Um, I'm not going to tell you which way you should vote. It is very important that everybody votes whatever they believe so that we have the opportunity as a nation to uh, have the leaders that we choose. And despite my accent, I am a US citizen, so. Um, 
Now we have a very small number of minutes left before the hour turns, uh, but I think we can take a, a few questions. And John, do we have any to 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 look to answer at this point? Well, maybe we have a quiet group today, Ian. Well. One thing I do know about this group is that this is not a quiet group. So if you are being quiet, it is just for the benefit of the next few minutes. So go and make your noise where your noise needs making. And thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.